All right, if you have your Bibles, let's go to Acts chapter number two. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? Well, I sure am glad you're here. It's, uh, it's great to have a good number of you here today, and thank you for every Sunday making an effort. I know, I know you fight through a lot of things, weather, um, busyness, sickness, uh, difficulty getting up and getting going, and uh, getting kids ready. Uh, I, I remember those days, especially my kids in general now getting themselves ready, but I remember those days of having to help Karen with that, and I, I, I just thank you for, I, I believe God blesses you for prioritizing his house on his day. And uh, it's exciting to, to walk in. I, I hope that you sense some excitement about things happening. And uh, along with excitement comes uh, maybe some discomfort about certain things. And uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. You need to be okay with that as well. And uh, we're, we're very blessed to have beautiful facilities. We're just trying to do some things here in this church that'll make it even more beautiful. We, we're, we're blessed with a beautiful auditorium. Uh, we just want to make it more beautiful. And as a result of that, be able to be more welcoming to the community, to visitors, to people that need Christ and need the love of Christ. And uh, I think we'll enjoy it, of course, but also might make our atmosphere here more conducive for, for visitors uh, and for uh, all sorts of generations to come to our church. Well, what we have before us today uh, could potentially be a very controversial passage. I will make every effort today not to be controversial. We also, as we talk about the tongues issue, the issue of speaking in tongues, uh, I won't be able to answer every single question and address every single uh, aspect of this issue. It's just not the nature of a Sunday morning message uh, or our purpose today. I will touch on some things. Uh, but let's begin in Acts chapter 2, and uh, the message today will cover verses 4 through 41. We will just read right now uh, from 4 through, um, uh, let's see here, I think we're going to go up to where, where people got saved, um, up through verse number, let's see here, maybe 15, we'll, we'll, we'll go up there. What did I tell the media team? Do y'all know? Okay. All right, we'll figure it out. But I want to share with you that in the second half of the message up through, let's see, from verses 14 through 41, it's the message of Peter. So I really want to encourage you at some point uh, this week, I read this, this message over several times this week, it is really the first Christian message in the Word of God. And so uh, that, that wasn't preached by Jesus. It's preached by Peter. And so we won't have time to read that all today, but it is worth your study, worth your time to digest that. Uh, so that's, that's uh, something I just want to commend to you. Uh, so, all right, let's read verses 4 through uh, probably 13. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Begins to list the different types of ethnic people that were there, uh, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia. I've always thought that that kind of sounds like a drink at Starbucks, like give me a grande Cappadocia. <laughs> but it's a geographic region. Uh, verse 9, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, uh, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, uh, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. Well, I want to preach to you really the second half today of what, a message we started last week. Uh, so today's entitled Pentecostal Power Part Two. Let's pray. Father, the responsibility I have and the privilege really to preach and to teach the Word of God is not lost on me today. 
And Lord, it can be a very complex subject, and it's, it, but Lord, there's some very basic principles and very exciting things that we should uh, settle on today. And I pray that you'll help us to understand, Lord, that what we truly want is the miracle of the souls being saved. What we truly want is the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Not exactly every necessary ingredient that we find in Acts chapter two, but the principle behind it is God moving in a church. And we pray today that you'll move, that you'll, uh, you'll move freely in our hearts or you'll give me liberty in the pulpit and give understanding uh, and good listening ears to the audience today. And of course, God, more appropriate than ever before today uh, is that I pray for you to fill me with the Holy Spirit as I preach and as I teach. And I pray that uh, understanding will be uh, given to the text and accuracy and application as well. And we thank you for it and pray that you would unite us around the Word of God today, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici was a great Renaissance artist um, in the 1400s or so. Uh, he, he staged uh, amazing shows for the public. Uh, his productions were amazingly realistic, and they had several realistic religious pageants uh, that he performed in churches, but one Pentecost, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici went too far. In this stage play, he used actual fire <laughs> to, uh, to display and to portray the descent of the, of the tongues of flames that fell on the apostles here in Acts chapter 2. The, 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 the fragile stage set caught on fire, and before the horrified audience the entire church burned to the ground. The lesson is clear from that story. Pray for Pentecostal power, but don't try to manufacture it. But still, many misguided believers and many in the charismatic and Pentecostal denominations jump right into the middle of Acts chapter two and claim to speak in tongues. They pray for Pentecost to happen again. But to, to pray for Pentecost to happen again is to ignore the simple fact that it was a historical event prophesied centuries earlier with non-repeatable action. We, we cannot exactly duplicate Pentecost any more than we could duplicate Bethlehem or Calvary. In just a moment, you'll see that the first point today is point number four, and that's because last week we did the first three points. Last week we covered uh, the significance of Pentecost, the sound of Pentecost, and the sight of Pentecost. I reminded you and taught you then, we looked at this fact that Pentecost was an actual event that the Jewish people, an actual feast, the Jewish people celebrated for around 1,500 years. But during this particular Pentecost in Acts chapter two, God chose to step in and intervene in a very unique way. God chose to use this day in the local church here as a way to introduce the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in a very unusual way. They were anticipating this. They, they knew this was coming based on the words of Jesus and the Gospels, based on Acts chapter one and verse four, where the, where the giving of the Spirit is called the promise of the Father. And uh, may I remind you that God always fulfills his promises. So they anticipated, they knew this was coming. This imparting of the Spirit is called the gift or the promise of the Father. And remember, this is an important thing to understand, that there is a difference between the indwelling of the Spirit that happens at salvation and the filling or the empowerment of the Spirit that happens at some point subsequent or after our salvation. Now, I will share with you unashamedly that my position, and I know the position of this church, is that we believe that the gift of tongues has ceased. Now, I invite you to turn quickly. I don't think I told the media team this, but we'll just take a rabbit trail if that's okay, and I'll just subtract something else from the message, all right? How's that? Uh, 1 Corinthians. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. Sometimes you wonder, well, if he takes this rabbit trail, how much time is this adding to the service? It won't be long. 
I want you to, to see just quickly, just, we just seem to just touch on this so that you understand what kind of the biblical position of those that, that would be called cessationists, meaning we believe tongues, the spiritual gift of tongues, ha, they've ceased. And we, we get this uh, from a variety of places, but mostly right here in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse number eight. Big chapter on love, big chapter on, on God's type of love, charity, agape love. Verse eight, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect which is perfect is come, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. I want you to understand, and I know we could spend much more time here, that one of the reasons why we believe that tongues has ceased is because of that portion of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. And it says that prophecy will cease, tongues will cease, and to some degree, the gift of knowledge will cease, because right now we know in part, we do things in part, but when that which is perfect is come, all these things will go away. Now, we believe, the Bible teaches there, that when that which is perfect refers to the Word of God, that when that which is perfect, the the perfect canon of Scripture, the perfect, inspired, preserved Word of God, when the Scripture is complete, when that which is perfect is complete, we'll have no need for some of these things that were used to kickstart the church movement. There are those where we are cessationists. There are those that are continuists. And they would look at that verse, and I'm just giving you their side of the argument for fairness. They would say that that when that which is perfect is come, they would say that's referring to Jesus. And that things won't be fully perfect and fully realized as far as our spiritual understanding of things until Jesus comes and returns to earth the second time and sets up his kingdom. Uh, So I'm happy to talk with you more about it in detail and share with you some more uh, background behind why we believe what we believe, but you need to understand, uh, and I'll explain that a bit further in the first couple of points here of the message, that tongues have ceased. Well, here's point number four. Here's point number four, our first point today, and that is the speaking, the speaking of Pentecost. So with that introduction, with that understanding Church, what happened the very first time the Spirit came down on a church service? It was unique, and it was special. Watch it now. Something audible occurred. There was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Something visible occurred. Tongues or flames of fire descended and rested in some fashion on the heads of those who were being filled with the Spirit. Something audible occurred, something visible occurred, and something verbal. Something verbal occurred, the the speaking in other languages. It's important that we understand uh, that we test the claims of those who say they have similar experiences to Acts chapter 2. A famous Bible teacher, M.R. Dehan, said that he runs into various people all the time who claim to have uh, spoken in tongues and claim to have had a Pentecostal experience. And he asks them, well then, where was the sound of the mighty rushing wind? And where was the fire? Where was the demonstration, the visible fire? It's a fair question if you follow the logic. Why is it always just the speaking in tongues part that uh, happens in some church services and not all the ingredients uh, to duplicate in Acts chapter 2? Well, the disciples were there, and they're, 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 they're sitting. I want you to see them there. They're sitting, and they're waiting. They've been praying for about 10 days, waiting for the filling, waiting for the promise of the Father. They're, they're not in a frenzy. They're not chaotic, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're focused on the Lord. They're focused on spiritual things. That's a good thing for a church like us, for any church to be sitting there and in great anticipation for what God might do or what God promised he will do. It's, it's good for us to focus on those things. The, the position of these believers 
is uh, specifically stated. They, they were not standing. They were not begging. They were not barking like dogs. They were not going crazy. They were not pleading. They're not waving their hands and shaking violently. They're not jumping or running up and down the aisles. They are quietly and calmly waiting and sitting. God is a God of order. And one of the most clarifying chapters about the tongues movement is 1 Corinthians 14. And the last verse of that says, God is a God of order. When the Spirit of God uh, came upon the apostles, here's what happened. The speaking part. Each was able to speak in a known foreign language. Here, here, uh, uh, definitions are always helpful. What is tongues? When we talk about the spiritual realm, talk about Christian things that happen here in Scripture, what is tongues? Well, listen, tongues is a known language except to the person speaking it that God gives to the believer for the purpose of praise to God and proclamation of God's Word. I'll say it again. Tongues is a known language except to the person speaking it that God gives to the believers here for the purpose of praise to God and proclamation of God's word. Tongues show up in one gospel, Gospel of Mark. Jesus talks about it in Mark chapter 16. Tongues show up five times in Acts and about 16 times, uh, 22 times I'd rather say, in 1 Corinthians. The word tongue. The idea of tongues comes from the Greek word glossa, you might hear in that glossary. It's where we get our word, it's transliterated into our word glossary. And later in verse number six, so we have the word tongues showing up in verse number four, but in, in, the, in verse six, when it says they heard them speak in their own language, you see that? Say yes. yes. All right. So tongues in verse four, language in verse six is a different word, obviously, and that's the word in Greek, dialectos. Dialectos, you might hear in that, our English word for dialect. This is much narrower, narrower than language. So we have glossa, glossary, speaking of just words, and then dialectos, which narrows the funnel down to a specific dialect, much narrower than language. So what does that mean? Let's put all these things together. That means that they not only heard them speak in a different language, heard them speak in an actual language of a particular person or nationality or language or person, but the actual dialect of that particular person or region or district. For example, you may know that Spanish in Peru is different from Spanish in Spain or Spanish in Mexico. These were known languages. These were known languages and not at all uh, the, the babbling and the gibberish that you might hear in a Pentecostal experience today. This consisted, back then in Acts 2, it consisted of vocabulary, grammar, and order. A very interesting experience happened to us once in Charleston. And I, I do want you to know that I want to be very careful not to, um, to mock or be critical of those who believe they've experienced tongues in their life. Uh, I, I don't want to mock or demean their character or their love for Christ or anything like that, but we had a, a lady in our church in Charleston for a spell, and she believed that, that she had the gift of tongues, and specifically when it came to a certain type of prayer language that she prayed. And this lady's name was Janice, and she came. She lived actually across the street from the church, and she said she wanted to come uh, demonstrate how she prayed in tongues for my wife and I. Our kids were very little, and we didn't want to confuse them, and so we locked them in Landon's bedroom, all three of them, <laughs> so that they wouldn't uh, be affected by this and, and gave them an iPad or something. And then, and, and, and I, listen, I, and I mean this, Janice loved the Lord. She studied the Bible. She, she, she was a Christian. I, I'm, not, I'm not calling any of those things into question, but this experience for Karen and myself, we're just, it was just kind of, kind of strange. And so she uh, told us about how when she was growing up that someone told her that if she really wanted to be filled with the Spirit, she would be given her own special prayer language. And uh, so she turned around right there on our couch in our living room there in Charleston, and she prayed for several minutes. And I'm not going to imitate for you how it was, uh, but it, 
it was kind of like if you had given a squirrel a five-hour energy drink, <laughs> that's kind of what it sounded like. It was very fast, it was very, it, a lot of effort went into it, it was very guttural, and it was just a lot of clicking and different types of noises. And she was very sincere. And when she was done, she wiped the sweat from her brow, and she got up and she sat down in the couch and she was exhausted. And I said, what happened? What did you do? She said, I prayed to the Lord. And I said, what did you say? And she said, I don't know. And I was, I don't know, I was young in ministry. I, I still am rather young in ministry. <laughs> but I, the next thing that came to my mind, I said, well, then I don't think that's what prayer is because prayer is communicating with God. And if you don't know what you're praying, how can you communicate? If I go utter some gibberish to Karen, how do I, there's no intimacy there. Even Jesus Christ, when he prayed his most intimate prayer with God the Father in John 17, he used words, actual words. There's no evidence of Jesus praying in tongues or anything like that. Uh, and um, and I, I'm reminded also about how what, what Paul says, and you should, you should cross-reference all, the best commentary on tongues is the Bible itself. Not the preacher's opinion. The best commentary on tongues is really in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, I prayed with the Spirit and I pray with understanding. I sing with the Spirit and I sing with understanding. And so what we're dealing with here is something that was for this time period, something that, that existed in, in some fashion in the early days of the church. I, I do believe in the early days of the church there, were, there was also praying in tongues and speaking in tongues. But, but some direction and some order got involved in this and eventually it went all away. So understand that they spoke in a different, actual, understandable foreign language that was clearly understood by those who could speak the language. The words on other tongues, again, it refers to this fact that this, what, what people were saying, what some of these Galileans Peter and others, the apostles there, we don't, we're not told exactly who or how many of these uh, early church, this 120 folks in the upper room, how, how many of them did this? Maybe many of them, maybe a few of them, we don't know. But they, they spoke in a language that was not their normal given tongue. And people heard them. People heard them in their language. These languages were not unknown gibberish. They were existing languages not previously known by the speaker. I don't have a gift for languages. I've had Greek, I've had Spanish. Uh, I, I have to know how to, how to kind of present teaching material about languages, but it takes years of study to learn a foreign language. Even with apps today and, and uh, programs like Babel and Rosetta Stone, it takes years to perfect the, the ability to speak. Missionaries go to language school for years and years and years, and then for years and years manuscript and write out their entire message in the foreign language because they don't want to mess up. I was at a missionary conference in Honduras once, and for just for fun, they had all the missionaries there that were English-speaking uh, naturally, that was their native tongue, stand up and say, what are some of the silly or inappropriate things you've said in Spanish in a church service uh, that your church laughed at? So, he's, so here you got this missionary who's preaching his heart out, and all of a sudden the church just starts laughing, <laughs> like he said some kind of uh, inappropriate joke, because words are so close, and they're like one word means, you know, sanctification and you say it wrong it means toilet <laughs> so when the Holy Spirit came upon these apostles it was unique and special the Holy Spirit gave them a supernatural ability to communicate a message in a precise normal accurate actual human language that the apostle who was speaking it did not previously know he hadn't studied it he hadn't learned that language so this was special it was unprecedented time when the filling of the Spirit resulted in speaking in tongues. Hey, listen, this is important. All through the rest of the New Testament, we, we do read in Acts, especially of, of, in 1 Corinthians, of, of believers who, who spoke in tongues. There were always unbelievers present. It was always for the benefit of unbelievers but we read mostly of many, many, many believers who were filled with the Spirit who did not 
speak in tongues. That was not this automatic evidence of being filled with the Spirit. In fact, um, Paul clarified all that again in 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. You understand the uniqueness of this event, that we don't seek to duplicate everything we find in Acts. It's descriptive, it's not prescriptive. It's not saying, hey, do this, try this. It's rejoice in this. Understand that this is why this was here and what purpose it served. And let's get into more of that. Point number five, the stir of Pentecost. The stir of Pentecost. Why would God do this? Well, I don't think that God did this and why we find Acts 2 in the Bible so that we could just have a bunch of Christians arguing about it, disagreeing over I don't think that's the point either. But Pentecost was a reversal of Babel. Pentecost was in many ways a reversal of the judgment at the Tower of Babel. That's back in Genesis 11 where God confused the languages. God told the people to, to, to scatter out, to go multiply and subdue the earth and have dominion over God's kingdom. And they decided, no, we're going to build a kingdom and a tower for ourselves. We're going to lock ourselves down. We're going to grow closer. We're going to praise man. We're going to build up man. And God says, I'll, I'll make this easy for you. I'm going to make you so you can't understand each other. And so you do have to scatter to the ends of the earth. And so God's judgment at Babel scattered the people, but God's blessing at Pentecost united the believers in the spirit. At Babel, people were unable to understand each other, but at Pentecost, people heard God's praises. They heard God's word and what was said. The Tower of Babel was a scheme designed to praise men, but Pentecost brought praise to God. So, so here's, the, here's the scene. In Jerusalem, on this day of Pentecost, they were devout men from every nation under heaven. This was a national holiday, and people had gathered. Jews had traveled from all around. The Bible lists about 15 or 16 different regions and countries and uh, ethnic groups that assembled here. They all were converging on Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. It was like an international contingency of multicultural and multilingual people. So a after the feast, after this was over, these people would have left and they would have traveled home. So this, get this now, this was a perfect time to kickstart the church age, to really let these 15 or 16 different people groups hear the gospel, be moved by this miracle of speaking in tongues, and then to travel home and pff, here goes the gospel. They're taking the gospel with, with them as they go home. And you really, you really, if you don't know how this relates to the Old Testament, you can't bring your tongues argument to the table very accurately. Because they would have known, they would have, if you know your Old Testament, you understand their response. It's very likely that most Jews who were present here for this wonderful event, they knew what Isaiah said, Isaiah 28, 11. It says this, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Let me explain. So when Peter and the others stood up and declared in foreign languages the truth of God's plan through Jesus Christ, every rabbi who had Isaiah tucked away in his mind, every devout Jew or Jewish leader who had the scroll of Isaiah somewhere in his possession, their great prophet, they revered Isaiah. They must have shuddered with, they're hearing this truth, they're hearing this, this throwback to all the prophets. They, 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 they must have understood, could this be the sign that we have crucified the God-man, that we have crucified the wrong Messiah, that we have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, in fact, clears away all sorts of doubt in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. He says that yes, tongues were a sign for the unbelieving Jew that Christ was the true Messiah. I hope you wrote that verse down if you want to look it up later, 1 Corinthians 14, 22. They accuse the people of being drunk. That's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Because the Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Interesting comparison. They thought they were drunk because wine is associated with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 5.18, by the way. 
So Paul there in that verse relates the two in contrast. He says, when a man drinks, he loses control, loses his mental faculties, loses control of his motor skills. He ends up being ashamed. He ends up making a fool out of himself when a man gets drunk or a woman gets drunk. But when a person is filled with the Spirit, good things happen. They're emboldened. They're empowered. Uh, they, they, are, they, they are full of spirit control, not, not lack of self-control, and they glorify God. Strong drink, alcohol can bring a temporary exhilaration, but being filled with the Spirit, that gives deep satisfaction, Amen. lasting joy, and real purpose. I'll tell you that the people's response it's the same as what we see today. The Bible lists several types of responses. Some were amazed. Some were confused. <laughs> Some were questioning. Some began to mock. Guess what's next after this? Beatings and imprisonment. There was a whole host of reactions, and let me tell you this, that the reactions, I'll tell you today, the people have the same responses today to the truth of Christ. There are skeptics today, there are unbelievers today who will look at you and they will see what God has done in your life and they will, they will they say, I can't explain what I'm looking at. I can't explain the peace this person has or the direction and the purpose this person has. I can't explain how that person's been changed and transformed. And I wanna know more. And they'll be confused, but they'll be questioning, and they'll be open, and they'll be amazed at what God has done in your life. But there will be others as you share your faith. There will be others as you just simply live the Christian life in front of this lost world that will be very critical, very full, full of mocking. They'll call you a nut. They'll call you crazy. They'll call you a fanatic. They will not understand because they're on a path to ridiculing and rejecting the, 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 Jesus Christ, their Messiah. The responses are all over the place. But there was this stir being done. And let's close today by examining quickly what we did not read, but it's the Sermon of Pentecost. The Sermon of Pentecost. And I have to admonish you to read it on your own time, 14 through 41. So now that, they, now that Peter has their attention, he stands up and preaches the main sermon of the day. It had three points, so he must have been a Baptist. It was only 10 minutes long, so maybe not. <laughs> Often, I will pray, and you will hear me pray, that as I preach, that God will fill me with the Spirit. And what we have right here in Acts chapter 2, when Peter stands up, is the very first time that happens. It's the very first time that an individual is filled with the Spirit for the purpose of proclaiming the Word of God. If you've never preached, I can tell you this. I know what it's like to not have the filling of the Spirit. Sometimes there's sin in my life. Sometimes I wake up on Sundays I don't even want to come. Sometimes I just have a bad spirit. Y'all looking at me really, really pious right now like this never happens to you. <laughs> How dare you? And I have on the other end of that spectrum, I have known what it's like to really feel like it wasn't even me speaking where I was extra careful, I was extra yielded to the Spirit, and I, I feel like he kept me from saying things I shouldn't say, which you can probably, you probably have a running list of things I shouldn't have said. But he helped me say things that I needed to say. And, and I hope that you've walked out of a church service before thinking, the Lord was there today. I wish it could happen all the time. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. We're fallen human individuals and we're full of sin and the flesh gets in the way. And There's times when preachers like me step into a pulpit we have something we want to get off our chest rather than preach from our heart. I know people use this pulpit as a bully pulpit. 
or a soapbox and they try to hammer away at some kind of opinion or philosophy or issue or try to solve some problem that maybe one or two people in the church are doing. Forgive me for that. Forgive us for that as pastors. But Peter, man, if you really knew Peter, who is this guy? If you knew Peter in the Gospels, he was always putting his foot in his mouth. The Peter, before the Spirit, he was unstable. The Peter, after the Spirit, he was unstoppable. He was bold and empowered. He was inspiring. He confronted them with the truth. Why? How? The reason is the Holy Spirit. And if you are filled with the Spirit, you'll have something to say about Jesus also. It's just a natural outflow of being Spirit-filled. Peter, I don't believe, preached in tongues. I, I think this tongues thing happened in the first part of the chapter. I think Peter stands up and he probably spoke everyday Aramaic. Why? Because this was a message by a Jew to the Jews on the Jewish holy day about the death and the resurrection of the Jewish Messiah that the Jewish nation, nation had crucified. That's why I think it was just for them. You stay with me. He explained how it happened. The Holy Spirit had come, as predicted by prophets like Joel and Isaiah, the Spirit had come. Then he explained what happened. Jesus Christ had been killed by the wicked hands of a Jewish nation. This is verse 23. And yet he had risen from the dead. we got to read it because this is a great message. Verse 23, Acts 2, 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. He said, here's how it happened. The Spirit came. Here's what happened. God gave his Son and you crucified the Messiah. Here's why it happened. And then we go to verse number 37. Now when they had heard this, are you there? Say, got it. Are you there? I'm giving you time. Here we go, verse 37. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to, unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He told them how it happened. The Spirit came. He told them what happened. Jesus came and you crucified him. He told them why it happened. It happened to convict them of sin. It happened to prick their heart. And they asked, What should we do? And Peter said, Repent and be saved. By the way, every time you and I come to church, I don't care if I'm preaching or who's preaching, if I go sit under the teaching of God's Word, I, I, I'm, I'm looking uh, for all of us to arrive at, some, at the same information. How? What? Why? In the Scriptures. And then you and I say, what do I do? That's preaching. How? What? Why? How then should I live? What should I do? That's what preaching ought to do for us. Did I wrap this up? Do you know what the real miracle of Pentecost was? The real miracle of Pentecost wasn't the wind and the flames and the speaking in other languages. The real miracle of Pentecost was the 3,000 people who were saved. Don't miss that part for all the other details that we fight over. A soul being saved is still the greatest miracle of all. And they were not saved because of some sort of manipulation or they were not pricked in their hearts because people were begging them or pleading them to raise their hands and walk aisles. Peter did not ask for any instruments to play just as I am with, a, come on down. He didn't do any of that stuff, we're not told at least. He didn't uh, emotionally try to plead with the people to respond. 
These 3,000 people were saved by a powerful presentation of the gospel given in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. And I believe this too. I believe that this gift of tongues and this scene right here was to let the people know that the gospel was for the whole world. Not just those that speak English or those that spoke Aramaic or Koine Greek. The gospel is for every language. So that one day around the throne we'll bow down and worship the Lamb with a choir of voices. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. God wants every person to hear the gospel. He wants to save folks on every continent, in every country, in every city. And the emphasis in Acts is not, well, let's go speak in tongues more. The emphasis in Acts is let's go spread the gospel in worldwide evangelism. Let's get the gospel out there to all those that need to hear it because we've seen what happens when the power of God fills us. We've seen how lives can be changed. Henry Martin said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions and the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. In other words, we don't seek for these gifts. We don't seek for this 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 unique manifestation of tongues, we seek to get close to the Lord. We seek to be truly filled with the Spirit and then he'll do amazing things through us. How many of you believe that Acts chapter two is true? It's, it's almost unanimous. If Acts chapter two is true, if you believe Acts chapter two, then here's what you're saying. You're saying that you understand that God is able to change you and empower you and use you to stand up somewhere and preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the big picture, not, well, God wants me to speak in tongues. No, no, no. God empowered Peter. God empowered others to stand up and unashamedly, boldly confront people with the truth of God's word. So if you're saying you believe this book is true and this account in Acts chapter 2 is true, you are saying that God is able to take you and empower you and use you to stand up and be a bold witness for him in this lost world. That's what you're saying you believe. If you believe Acts 2, you don't have to speak in tongues. You just have to use the one you've got. and we can experience the power of Pentecost. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I invite you to stand today. I hope the message helped with some clarity, some questions you had, and then I hope, of course, that we see the big picture. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed today, and of course, we do things different than they did in the early church. We do have music, we do have an invitation, because as we cover the how and the what and the why, it leads us to ask the question, what should I do? What should I do? What should you do? I think we should pray for the filling of the Spirit in each of our lives. So that's not our words, but His words. So it's not our shyness, but His boldness. So it's not our manipulation, but the Spirit's working in hearts. Hey, beloved church family, if you were here last Monday and Tuesday to hear Brother Paulie preach, and if you're tracking with us in Acts, all these things are preparing us for some of the things we'll talk about tonight. And how, and how we need to do a better job of getting the gospel out to those around us and what we can do to make a difference. So the heads bowed and eyes closed, if you desire that power on your life, would you come and ask for it? Would you come and pray for it today? In your language, in English, talk to God. Pray to God and Jesus Christ in the Spirit and pray for that power to embolden you. I know even as I'm talking about being a pastor and how the Spirit affects me, you know what that's like for you as an everyday believer 
as a lay person, you know what it's like to, to be weak and to be uh, anemic and to be uh, uh, limited in what you see God do and you just feel like you have no passion for the Lord and you know what it's like to feel on fire and to have that spirit and have that power and to walk into a, a gospel opportunity with boldness and with clarity. You know what that's like. And we need more believers like that if we're gonna see the power of God like they saw in Acts chapter two. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm gonna pray and ask you to spend some time during this invitation to respond. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your savior, we can help you with that. We'd like to answer your question and show you from a Bible how you can leave here today knowing that Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and was buried and rose again for your sins, how that Jesus Christ can be your personal savior. We have some folks here today that are maybe at church for the first time in a long time. Maybe you've not heard a message from the Bible in a long time. Maybe God's pricking your heart and speaking to you about being saved, about making sure that you're on your way to heaven when you die, not based on who you are and your own works, but on the merit of Jesus Christ. I'll invite you to come. Just come down front here. And I'll come down and shake your hand. I'll find a counselor. I'll find a man, if you're a man or a woman, if you're a woman, and they'll take a Bible and show you how you can be saved today. You can leave here with eternal life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we love you and thank you for the, the opportunity to study the word of God once again today. Lord, we need it so much. We need understanding. I pray for, Lord, this church, this congregation, individuals all the way up, Lord, whatever holds us together as a whole, that as a whole we might experience and be filled with the Spirit and experience the, the blessings of the power of God upon our lives. It's going to take confession of sin. We have to repent, change our ways, and align ourselves with you. I pray that people will do that today. That they'll desire, they'll, that they will desire a power they've been living without for so long. I pray for anyone here today in this auditorium or watching the service on live stream who is not a true Christian, they're not a believer, they don't have peace in their lives about their eternal destiny. I pray that you'll bring conviction to them and courage to them to get it settled. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Instruments are now playing. You do what God is speaking to you about doing today.